And we have our next speaker coming up over here, Jonathan Wright. Uh, Jonathan actually has a podcast. It's called the uh, QA Lead. Uh, I, I like to give a, 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 a little heads up, a, a, a shout out to that because, well, because he asked me to come over and speak with him on, on that. Uh, we've been having a ton of fun for at least two or three years on uh, several different projects uh, out there uh, with the British Computing Society. So um, I, uh, and, and I think I, I, I I met up with him at the beginning of the uh, the pandemic. Uh, we had a virtual in, uh, a, a virtual event where everybody kind of came together, and we all kind of had little avatars walking around in three D. And uh, <laughs> if you had VR goggles, it was even more intense. So it was just uh, just a, a ton of fun uh, out of that, and even won myself a free a second pair of VR goggles going to that. So it's fantastic. Um, anyway, uh, there's Jonathan. Hi. Hey, how's it going, Paul? It's going I've, good. I've and, you. uh, your mic is working. What's that? I'm sorry. I, I've missed. I've missed you. Ah, oh, I you miss know, you I, too, I, man. I, yeah, we got I, a little romance going on over here. All about test automation. It's it's fantastic. It guys, is. And, so. and the thing is, we got the Mercury men that are both in our background. So we got the Mercury. Yes, thing. We, yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, we go back a ways to our. Yep. Well, that one's not worth anything anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, back in our days when we were working at, at Mercury, and in fact, I believe I also have a, uh, I even got a Mercury. Uh, a oh, old, I, uh, I have that mug. It's awesome because the screw top keeps everything really cool. Yes. Um, yes. And they, and people keep sending, other tools keep sending me stuff. So I always like to kind of show off uh, other, <laughs> everybody, I got my little list of all these tools and, and companies that send me stuff. So it's always kind of cool. Um. I wish I would have gotten in ton of those. I think I had like a million points of support points, and I just cashed in one. I'm like, I should have gotten ten of those things. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to talk too much more about this. Uh, we've got Jonathan right here, and uh, and uh, he's, he's going to talk to us a little bit about digital twin testing. Again, another area that I am not entirely familiar with. I am looking forward to learning a lot more stuff. So, Jonathan, you can unlock the codex and give us some uh, cool information about digital twin testing. Take it away. Wonderful. I, I'm just checking that my microphone sounds OK. I, re I just realized that I, I've got, as you probably can tell from the background, I've got like six microphones, um, like 12 screens. Um, so I'm kind of sat there talking into this microphone, which is sure one the mic what Michael Jackson used, um, and um, then realizing that actually it's not that mic, because I'm on a different net network thing so so hopefully you can hear me okay it and sounds clearly. much better yeah you're okay. five by five that's, now that's what we needed to do um and yeah and you know of course you know well we need to catch up especially with the um i'm sure you heard about the the like everybody in the entire world did about uh open text acquiring microfocus which was hp which was mercury um which is a very interesting landscape um uh, in the last couple of weeks so yes yeah, so lots of interesting stuff happening uh and exciting times to talk about and you know I, i'm probably not going to get as much coding in my session as that um you know i i, I like you you know api testing um i want to say is 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 my friend um but of course you know uh i'm, I'm seeing more and more stuff with packed um as, as kind of a way that people are starting to use it uh, I actually did have a call the other day with with a good friend of mine, Alon, who was the founder of Blazemeter, and he's also the founder of a company called Up9.com, Up oh. and then the number nine.com, which is does all of the stuff that was demoed there, but uses AI to actually generate it. Very, very sophisticated, very clever platform. Um, and he actually showed me a demo. It, I think it was in. Uh, it wasn't in Eclipse, so you don't need to worry. But it was in Visual Code. <laughs> and, and, VS Code, and it literally, um, you know, you, you, you pointed it to a, a Swagger or an Open API spec, it would auto generate the, the payload and everything they needed. But then as soon as you pointed it to the new version, it would then regenerate everything. So you could kind of get to that point where, if, you know, if you're reliant on rest assured and, you know, wire mark and stuff like that, and you know, having to keep on changing things, it really it accelerates stuff. So anyway, I better share my screen because I'm getting told off by the moderator to just sit and talk to you, which, in all fairness, would be fantastic. Uh, but uh, I guess I should show people something, otherwise they've they've come to see the the Jonathan show, right? Um, so hopefully, you can 
see my screen um and it should say shift right to the into the metaverse with digital twin testing so as long as you can i'm going to just start, start continuing anyway um I, I think we've got we've got an hour um i don't want to um bore anybody so however long it takes it takes um uh you know i think you know I, interestingly i've just been sat on a call um literally while i was preparing for this uh talking to the teams around uh testing uh in the in the metaverse and i'm going to show you some of that stuff what i've been doing um you know as kind of uh my good friend paul kind of mentioned before you know i've um you know i've been sat in kind of the automation space uh for for, for 25 years now or four decades depending on which way you want to look at it um you know i i, I did a, originally did a, a ted talk uh, a few many years ago now and actually the ted talk covered uh the mixed reality in the metaverse he actually had a you know a scene which i'm going to replay in a second for you uh where you know it's going through what this the future look would look like um and so you know all the stuff what you see in the background is kind of stuff that i kind of i played with over time you know they're all kind of really quite kind of um complex very futuristic and, and literally the call that i was just on they were kind of saying to me you know you you know it's if, if if Gartner have got the metaverse at the top of the hype curve at the moment, literally launched it two or three weeks ago, uh, and you know, and we're talking, you know, with both Meta and and uh, Microsoft at the moment around testing in the metaverse uh, and automation is it's it feels like it's such a long way away, but in actual fact, uh, like everything in the, the in our industry, is that actually, you know, this kind of technology really does. Um, you know, it kind of changes the way that people uh, use and consume technology. So as soon as someone like, I know we've got the Apple event tomorrow, but as soon as they launch something like the Apple glasses, which is scheduled for 24 to 2024, 20, 2025, you know, the consumer adoption will just explode. And then of course, like Appium for mobile, there'd be equivalents. And, you know, my good friend, Sean Evans, who's uh, used to be one of the guys at uh, with Loadrunner, um he's just uh, i hate to interrupt you there jonathan uh we're it uh, looks like we're having a problem with the camera over there um okay. is it my uh, camera uh on on my side i can see it okay i'm i'm seeing the uh the uh your powerpoint being shared over here on my live session so i'm just checking with our moderator uh if everything looks better uh because over here, I can see the, the shift right into the metaverse with digital twin testing. Um, and it looked like the camera is OK on my side. So okay. I'm sorry to interrupt you. He, oh, says no the cam he says your camera is not working properly. I can see you from the YouTube stream. So I'm going to say, yeah. let's, let's keep this going, because it looks fine from my end. So my, my apologies yeah, well for interrupting. Oh, not a problem. You know, like I said, I could just spend all the, for the next hour just talking to you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we lose all our viewers. <laughs> we would more than so you know, it'd be worth, worth it. I can tell you that for nothing. Anyway, we'd start I, talking I'm about we start talking about Captain America and your little cameo in there. But okay, we'll leave that for a side for another time. <laughs> Absolutely. So I am looking at the um, the live feed. It does look like I'm slightly frozen, um, but I don't know if that is just because uh, we're doing it. But let, let's keep it going and see if let's if, keep going. If, yes. If, if it goes, uh, kind of work goes okay. So anyway, so yeah, like I said, so I kind of started in the nineties, um, you know, and you know, I, I, and you said to me, you know, do you want to promote anything? And even if you see the standard frame of me uh, in the background, uh, you'll see that I've got three, four books on the back of wall. And the, the I, well, lockdown happened. I, I published the, um, this, uh, the uh, well. It was about three weeks ago, well, three months ago, the artificial intelligence for software testing, which is on the far end. Um, so yeah, so I, I was I was part of uh, doing that. Now let me just have a quick look because it does look like I am still frozen. So let me just quickly change my camera to something else. Give me a second. And then hopefully, if it looks fine on mine, but it probably is something to do with technology. Uh, the great thing about having 12 screens is good, but then, you know, it's uh, a, a, an overhead as well. Yeah, it does look like I've got my cameras frozen. So give me a second. Disable camera, re-enable it. 
got to give it a few seconds to uh, come back into its life. Try it full definition. Uh, hmm. Anyway, you can hopefully you can still hear me. Anyway, even if the the camera doesn't um, let me show myself, even though it's coming up as maybe it's a bandwidth problem, and I can't can't imagine it's bandwidth. Um, but anyway, let let me swap that to another camera. I do have two cameras. Uh, see if this one is any better. Give me a second. I love the technical challenges of uh, doing these events. Uh, okay, so this is another angle. Let's see how long this camera survives for. Um, so yeah, so let me kind of move forwards a little bit and get. Let's get into this the, the metaverse stuff. So you know, part of it is, you know, like I said, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time uh, working at companies doing thought leadership. Um, you know, I've got another talk um, with the uh, Eurostar next week and, uh, and a few other events which I'll try and add in. Uh, but yeah, I, I kind of wanted to go back and, and talk a little bit about, um, you know, I talked about the fact that, you know, v VR seems like the future. Um, and, you know, I was in Santa Clara a couple of weeks back. And, you know, again, it was, the, you know, visiting the original garage, HP garage, where uh, Bill and, and Dave in the background on the left hand side uh, first set up their company in 1938 and 39. And then um, I was in Bletchley Park, which is just a few miles from where I am at the moment. Um, and saw the original works of, of Alan Turing, right? And, and you know, part of that is, you know, we talk about AI now in tech, um, but of course those things have been been published and talked about for, for many more decades, right? So anyway, let me kind of go through, and that was me in, in, in next to the HP garage the other day. So let me kind of get into the metaverse, and I'm gonna show you uh, testing the metaverse and, uh, and how that would work. And, most of the tech, in actual fact, in it, is is it quite easy to access from just your normal uh, automation kind of cap capabilities. So it's not that crazy, because um, in essence, the 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 Oculus is just a glorified um, Android device, right? So it, you, it in essence still runs a variation off off the standard Android kernel. So you can see where things like Appium being extended into doing testing in, in it, with the those headsets is quite easy. Of course, it's slightly different when you're looking at uh, mixed reality, and and so what, like I mentioned in the in the talk that I did, uh, mixed reality is where it overlays into the real world. Um, and so I'd done this kind of you can probably slightly see in the background uh, this kind of shopping segment where it's overlaying information into the real world. So so what does that actually look like? Um, so this is a, a kind of a, a, what the, the one that I actually demoed which shows you how it's overlaying all that information. So if you think about the contract testing you've just talked about, about all those kind of API endpoints, um, you know, uh, and you may be doing kind of multiple different uh, e kind of eco uh, E2E kind of environments, they're pulling out all that information and overlaying whether it's weather, whether it's advertising, whether it's, you know, um, telling you that you shouldn't be uh, walking on the road, all of that information is you know is, is is potentially going to be pulled from lots of different endpoints so it's going to be really interesting to see if you know i'm just closing on the uh, you know how this is going to change because you you're doing these things like the shopping experience and that shopping experience is going to potentially be you completely unique to you and you're augmenting this into your daily life now i was in the south of france last week at cap gemini's um campus and i was doing this demo with the hololens on top and walking around showing how into interacting with things and how we test it and of course people like cap gemini have recently announced that their partnerships with um unity and unity's in essence the um is the framework which most of the tools are actually running on so gamedriver.io which i mentioned earlier you know uh, from um from my friend you know part of it is they, they're hooking directly into Unity. Um, so anyway, so kind of gives you an idea of what maybe the future is going to look like. What does that look like from a testing perspective? How am I going to test these kind of next generation platforms? So like I said, I was in, in the south of France and I, I was doing, um, you know, this this demo, which you'll if I press play, you will see. Um, I was just kind of showing how the HoloLens works in the sense of it's understanding through using the multi lidar cameras where the floor is where the walls are where the depth is you know and it's used i'm using gestures using my hands 
Um, they also can do eye tracking. So it's looking at my eye using infrared and then understanding that as, in essence, another controller so I can move the location around. Uh, my good friend, T Todd, Toby uh, Marston on the left-hand side, who actually was uh, originally Mercury and HP as well. Uh, good, uh, you know, and part of validating these kind of environments is, you know, there's a number of different ways you can do this. Now, of course, it's an image, you see in an image, which is live stream from my headset. So you'll see me walk past my laptop and that stream of what I'm watching is streaming directly to that. And I can test that because in essence, it's a, a two dimensional image. And if I wanted to just overlay it, and I'm going to show you in a second how we do this with, with computer vision um, and, and Google computer vision, for instance, you can literally, I can literally say to uh, the tool or even, you know, Google uh, computer vision, show me a dog and it will highlight the dog on the screen. Now, of course, I then can overlay the actual um, cursor to tell it to click on that or interact with that. So you can kind of see what, how do you validate these new types of mixed reality landscape? And you probably see in the corner, it's, uh, it is last week, which was the 31st of the 8th or whatever it is. But as you can see, there's also all this additional sensor information. You know, there's sensor information mapping the floor, Toby's donut, which he's eating, you know, the, the, you can actually see the different, well, as it scans and learns the environment, it then understands there's a table there. So if I then wanted to walk over and drop an item onto the table, virtually or not virtually, you can see this kind of collaborative kind of, uh, you know, challenge. And so things like uh, Meta and um, what Meta Workspaces is a new way of collaborating with people who are using Teams plus using, uh, you know, VR and, and MR headsets to immerse themselves into these collaborative spaces to be able to actually work with people uh, in, in this new new world way of working. So, you know, part of it is, you know, I, I kind of, as you probably kind of expect by the multiple cameras that I've got here as well, is like, I usually have seven or eight screens around with me. I kind of, you know, take these around uh, multiple screens when I'm doing, typically working on, because you need quite a lot of kit when it comes to working with, you know, VR. It's obviously, it needs a lot of GPU. Um, and you probably did see that I, I actually used the Steam uh, Steam Deck for doing um, demos because I can, that's actually got a dedicated GPU in it. And I can actually plug in via the USB-C and I can actually stream stuff onto that device and then do the testing on that device. But you need to have that kind of kit to be able to actually test. The other thing is AI also has that additional level, things like computer vision. You, A, you need either connectivity to Google's um, you know, uh, service, or again, you need to use something like OpenCV or, or, or equivalent, which again is going to start utilizing your kit, which you're actually having on your machine. So. What, what's the real use cases? And so, you know, I was just talking to the guys about this uh, on, on the previous call is, you know, we're seeing things like you've seen probably on the right hand side is the, um, the Ray-Ban um, st stories, which obviously don't augment anything, but they're starting to introduce this idea of adding cameras to your glasses, a bit like Google glasses. Uh, so you can start looking at depth, et cetera, in you know, kind of a stereo image. You've got the traditional ones, you can see there, it's like a photo from 2000 and well, four years ago, you know, just using just uh, the, the, the sensors, sensors, which are on the, the lights that are on the actual uh, fixed directional inputs. And it's obviously tracking those. So that way you can, in this kind of lovely avatar world, uh, very similar to the Disney game that just released, uh, you know, you can put yourself in this virtual environment. So, you know, I, I was, I, the last event that I um, did, uh, well, last, event that I did last week was with uh, a guy called uh, Doc, Dr. Tarek King and, you know, from test.ai. Uh, and he, I show, you know, he showed me, you know, this kind of this, the standard demo, you know, all right, I can drive it and, 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 and sort the input so I can keep on saying move left, move left, move left, which is not a human activity. But you can, I can easily control any of the directional stuff because in essence, this control has just got an input to it. So this kind of technology is really quite simple, but then there's other aspects. Once you've got the ability to control the headset and move it, how do I then validate what's going on? So in this particular demo, I'm, I've got a script on the left with, uh, with Google uh, Computer Vision. I could use some other thing, but I'm just using it for this example. I'm running it with a string saying, look for uh, this value on the screen. And obviously it comes back and it highlights just like it would do on a normal kind of uh, DOM um, identification tool. 
same thing, put another change one, looking to suggest for you, it picks it up. But it, obviously it's wrapping in the sense of not like a Snoop Dogg, but it's wrapping the image around your eyes. So in actual fact, it's not a flat surface, even though it looks like a flat surface. Therefore, normal traditional OCR techniques of just looking for a, a string don't always work. And the next thing is then, okay, once I'm able to look and identify the items, so you probably can see in the bottom corner as it runs, it's found Internet Explorer, but now I'm having to move the directional um, controller to go left, to look, uh, go to, to be the same level as it, and then go up, and then click on it. And then, of course, you know, it's you know driving a browser and your normal Selenium kind of thing. In this particular case, we can say to it, look for something on the page. Additionally, as you can see, it's got the, the eggplant stuff instrumented on the actual device. On the right-hand side is actually all the telemetry information that's coming out, the GPU, what's working, the, uh, all the inf information that comes out from your inputs, the camera feed, so you can probably see there, Gareth in the Cambridge uh, R&D labs on Friday, you can take all that information and you can then dump that to a file. And then you can, in essence, as much as I never want to use the word record replay, um, you know, you can capture all of the inputs and then just play them back on the device using the auto uh, test function. So, like I said, a lot of this already, you know, exists as kind of a open standards. But again, this gives you the ability to drive any of these devices, any of the inputs on this. So whether that be the six directional controllers, which are in essence just Bluetooth device input devices, whatever it is, you can you can control in it and and, and power. So and this kind of level of you know capability, what what are, why, why do we anybody care about the metaverse, and you know why do we want to test it? Well, you know. I think we've all, including today, you know, we've all seen this kind of um, explosion post-pandemic. You know, of course, when I was talking to Paul a second ago, you know, well, the German lockdown, you know, we did a lot of this um, running events virtually. And I'm sure we've all got quite Zoom fatigued already. Um, but, you know, talking to the guys at Microsoft around kind of their platforms and what they're trying to do, they're obviously releasing Microsoft Mesh. Uh, which you see at the top is where you can then replace yourself with an avatar version of yourself. Now, you know, I'm sure everyone has been on enough calls recently and hardly anyone turns their camera off. And also cameras like it had today at a level of, you know, complexity and also bandwidth requirement. So this ability to just look at you, what your facial stuff and part of the eye tracking technology that they're using on, on at the next generation of Apple glasses, which, uh, sorry, Google Glasses, which was announced at the Google.io uh, event. And then, of course, uh, the, uh, the Microsoft Mixed Reality and, of course, the uh, Apple Glasses, which are, again, coming 2024-25. And as you can see, back in 2014, I'm wearing the, embarrassingly, wearing the first-generation Google Glasses. Of course, I had a lot of problems, a lot of privacy concerns. We've kind of been there a few times after. You know, it's, it's kind of this challenge of, you know, adoption. So, you know, I'm hoping we're going to start seeing a lot more of this kind of now that we can don't have to turn our camera on, people can still see gestures and impact. We're going to start creating more and more of an uh, avatar version of ourselves. Um, and yeah, and, and we're massively going to be kind of looking to the future of how we interact with other people. And um, I'm hoping that I can find uh, Paul on here. I'm sure he is somewhere. Uh, but yeah, during lockdown, you know, we ran uh, events where you know there's these little eight bit ones where you can walk around and interact with each other and talk to each other which is really cool um but you know i think we got quite bored of the same kind of format you know part of it is we wanted to be able to interact and as paul said we we, we ran a a few of these events uh and i'm sure we'll, we'll we'll i'm hoping that i can see paul in there i'm sure he is there um but yeah you know part of it is with these platforms, and this is one of the platforms you can see running this conference in VR. So we've got people, you know, on the standard Zoom thing in a 2D kind of landscape, but then we've got people walking around, actually talking and interacting uh, with other people in the room, um, and it just brought an extra level of depth. Now, of course, people might say, "Well, it's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a gimmick," but you know, being able to, things like Meta's commitment of renaming itself from Facebook, you know, spending 11.4 billion last year. On metaverse and spending a third, further 30 billion over the next couple of months, uh, it's going to be a couple of years. You know, suddenly this this is a big market. Uh, Gartner obviously are putting it on the hype curve. 
but also, you know, the, the industry is evaluated at somewhere between 300 and 500 billion by 2025. So massive investment from tech companies, of course, people like Facebook. Um, so yeah, actually, you know, I didn't really listen to this video in, but it's uh, Paul Grossman is actually on the, the bottom list on there. So hopefully I will wander past and see, see, see Paul at some point in time. Um, but you know, this kind of environment collaborating in is great, but also there's a certain level of realism. Your, your body, um, you know, will not, um, it will get, won't get, doesn't, doesn't believe it's a real thing unless it's running at the new devices. So Oculus 2, for instance, is running at 4K or 4K per eye at 120 frames per second. You know, the new Oculus Pro get launched this, uh, this month, twice the price as the consumer device. It's going to have the full uh, see-through um, into, the, into the real world, but just by cameras in colour. Uh, yes, here, here is Paul. He's, he's stood still. I'm sure he'll do something in a second. But actually, in this particular environment, Paul was presenting in in VR to people around doing a demo. He's actually doing a live demo whilst actually in, in VR. So you've got these techs got to work. If it doesn't work, it's going to, you know, it's going to have a real problem with, you know, how people collaborate, how people, you know, work together in remote locations. And, you know, uh, there was, of course, a, a famous bit of news about um, the twins that were separated using mixed reality technology um, from a, a hospital in the UK to somewhere, uh, uh, to these uh, uh, two twins that were attached. You know, part of it is you can see the use cases that are coming in from both military, of course, you know, HoloLens is famously known because of the 15 billion pounds worth of DOD contract. They've all just been rolled out into, um, you know, into the, U the US Army. So, you know, they're getting the information that pretty much allows them to see through walls, get GIS lo uh, locations of you know everybody's movement you know suddenly you know the technology for the next day is the next next generation is going to be huge um but yeah so we've seen this but then we're also seeing this in these kind of blended things where you've got a mix of an app on the left hand side and i, I was in uh, disney soon to be three times i was there in january uh i'm in uh anaheim and then i was back out there in in orlando um, so we're going on the same, you know, uh, thing over there. And then I'm back for Star West next month, speaking at Star West. Um, so I'll be back at Anaheim again. Th three times to Disney in, in one year is a bit too much for me. But, you know, part of it is what you can see on the left-hand side is it's saying go up to the, the, the shuttle and based on GPX information, it's then saying, okay, now do the next thing in the story. And the next thing in the story, you know, I'm queuing for, in that particular case, R Rise of the Resistance. And then you're augmenting that with, you know, the real world and what's happening on the right hand side, you know, which is, a, again, a unique experience is, you, you know, you're, it's using, G, it's a GPU. So everyone's inputting a device and it's the whole hydraulics and everything's moving. But you can kind of see how these mixed multi-reality experiences suddenly get something that's very, very basic to uh, actually, you know, go into shops, locating you to, to walk to other people or whatever else makes it you know, blurs the boundaries between the, the traditional mobile and the tech. Um, and, you know, part of this avatar thing, which, you know, we kind of mentioned about this representation of ourselves, um, you know, here's a kind of a 3D model of myself. Um, and, you know, part of it is me representing myself in that landscape, uh, in, in the metaverse, uh, in, in two or three dimensions is, is completely different to a standard avatar or, you know, uh, just represent in a flat image which people see. So, you know, you can start seeing that this kind of technology is there. The scanners that are actually up there on everyone's phone. So, if you've got a, you know, an iPhone, and I'm sure the new 14s coming out uh, tomorrow, you know, part of these uh, the lidar capability here allows you to scan your face and create a 3D model of yourself, and then you know, send that to your printer. You know, part of it is this tech exists. People do use it, um, and people are adding applications for it all the time. Um, and the thing is, you know, I, I got a guess, joked with Paul at the start, is that, you know, we've been here before. It's not, this isn't all new. And, you know, it, I, I'm speaking at a conference here in um, in Australia in, in, in uh, I don't know where it was at the time. But, you know, we're learning so much from things like the game industry. You know, the game industry has models which are built on physics engines, which we can understand to a certain level of re realism. And I'm going to start kind of introducing the kind of the concept of not only, you know, th 
applications like gaming driving this and, and i've got actually the, the, the picture in the, the photo is is, is a, every week every friday during lockdown i was part of a gamification guild um where i were trying to learn different techniques for engaging people and you know part of it is you know this isn't new um i did need to update this on my steam update this day but it you know um I, I, you know 16 years uh being on that platform and you know on the right hand side um you can probably see and this was uh you know in the 90s it this is actually a a 3d glasses so it was actually using the the scan very similar to um for every other frame to allow it a standard 2d uh screen obviously a crt monitor in those days to actually allow me to uh actually see something in 3d so you know this technology has gone through many waves and therefore you know mixed reality moving to VR is again isn't new this this kind of technology has been in there for a long time all these kind of gamification elements of you know competing against other people getting people to collaborate and you know get good scores from uh doing something whether it be coding or you know collaborating on a farm right um you know part of it is is these kind of levels of interaction uh which we've we've supported in the gaming industry uh and got, you can see how old that, that is on the right hand side I think You've got Julie Gardner and a few other people helping a you know create a farm. You know, part of it is you're testing this kind of um, gaming engine in essence, but in the real world because you're overlaying all the technology uh, and all the models to be able to validate. Well, what is the experience? How smooth it is? Uh, if you see on the bottom left hand side, that is actually a, a VR game which was Half Life. If anyone remembers, Half Life was the first really mainstream 3D game um you know they brought something out and you know if you go around it you feel very sick because your body doesn't believe that you're moving around or warping around because you're not walking whereas with mixed reality you can literally just walk around your house as normal don't bump into things and actually interact with a blurred technology in the real world so you know we've seen this for a long time we've seen kind of entire cities being able to be built you know in and again these things aren't new these these date back to the, the noughties um, and, and even some of the nineties. Um, but then we've got all these additional kind of things on top of it. So I, one of my friends, uh, a guy called Magic Zaleski, he's, you know, I always see him as the, the automation guy that I wish I was, uh, apart from being Paul, I could definitely be Paul as well. But, you know, I, last time I spoke to him, I, I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, well, I'm doing NFTs and, and crypto wallets and testing crypto wallets. Um, and of course, we all, you know, went through a phase of talking about blockchain and, you know, how would we test blockchain? It's that same kind of thing now. It's like you talk about NFTs, you know, um, how do you test NFTs? Or, in, you know, we, we know about for the metaverse, you can buy, I think Nike made hundreds of millions selling NFTs with trainers. So you could buy a, a pair of Nike Jordans as per behind me and then actually get a digital version off those shoes. So then if you literally turn your augmented reality camera on, you could see you're wearing these virtual shoes, which seems incredibly stupid, but actually because it's a item that's unique and you own, then you can actually put that into whatever world you are. So if you're playing Fortnite or you're actually in the metaverse, you will own that. And so people are starting to buy up estates in, um, you know, in, in the metaverse and actually buying cars, equipment. And if you've ever watched Ready, Ready Player One, you can start seeing that you know, these transactions for NFTs, which could be millions of pounds people are spending, you know, are really quite valuable. Even some people are even saying more expensive than the original, than the actual original item. So things like the Mona Lisa, owning the digital rights for that means you own, people have to pay you if they ever show it on the screen. But, you know, once you own it, you know, you, you own it uh, digitally. So really interesting, the NBA do it, uh, doing kind of, anyone who ever scores a basket, you can have that NFT. And then what they have behind that is something called an Oracle, not like Oracle as a database, but that Oracle informs it, that NFT about its status. So it'll have all the information about who shot it, how many shots he's ever done, what the time was, you know, what his entire, uh, you know, um, track record was. But moving into these, the VR experiences where, you know, Aston Martin actually sold one car, which was I think 3 billion with an NFT version of that car. And it was only one that they were ever going to make, one of the physical car and one of the digital car. You know, being able to, in you know, and if you've ever watched, uh, read the book Snow Crash, which is when the metaverse came out, uh, well, the term metaverse came out, 
you know, he has a samurai sword, which he inherited from his father digitally, as in it, the item doesn't really exist. But, you know, you can start seeing this blurring of the boundaries of, you know, driving a car like I did. I, I have a mini um, parked outside of me at the moment. And then having the, vid, the, the virtual version of that same car that you own. It's, it's a, you know, and, and you, people like I, I spoke to um, a couple of the German man of car manufacturers who are actually having NFTs in the cars. So you unlock an NFT to say you've done 100 successful car parks without crashing into anyone. Now you get the auto park feature, uh, you know, enabled on your car. We know BMW is doing, you know, heated seats as a service. You know, you could win those by, you know, uh, or, or even own it from your last car. And then when you buy the new car, they'll turn around and say, okay, well, you own the NFT or you'll sell that NFT, that unlock mode, which you got because you drove a Tesla very, very well for five years. You could sell that on and it would be an extra value item because only a handful of people have, uber level of, of their, their capability so you know this kind of tech as much as it sounds crazy and it sounds very futury you know i was at ces on the you can see on the right hand side in, back in uh january and you know everything that they had was things like this you know i i, I think if, if it doesn't happen in south park it's probably not a real thing but you know they were all talking about nfts they're all talking about creating nft marketplaces you know they're talking about you know um, blurring that kind of, well, when should I be giving an NFT away? You know, people like Spider-Man were, you know, showing, um, giving away a scene of the, the movie for people who bought the tickets to go and see the movie. So NFTs, the metaverse, of course, all sound like glorified, you know, uh, topics. But actual fact, this stuff, you know, is, is real, but it's also, you know, incredibly popular because people need to be able to test these environments. And got a picture there of a self-driving uh, uh, bus in, in Singapore when I was in Singapore. That's again, 2017, so five years ago. And our, our launch at Keysight, uh, which you can kind of see, there's me with my red jacket on all the time. Um, so we've created, on, just underneath this guy's hand, is that we've created a radar emulator. So it actually you know, allows people to test car to x by emulating up to 500 devices but 500 items, people walking across, birds flying out in front of the cars, whatever it is, they can do it and we can we test it, right? Keysight, for those people who are not familiar with, Keysight is actually the original Hewlett and Packard, what they were building in the garage. That instrumentation arm of, of HP got spun off into uh, to what is now Keysight Technologies in the same way Broadcom was a spin off of also HP. So that's where the HP kind of references come in. But again, you know, the scene emulators, they are this kind of this te technology to test autonomous cars. And, it, you know, there's a, a, an autonomous robot there, which is, I, I, I was sat next to in the in Santa Clara, one of the malls, right, which notoriously um, fell into the river because someone walked past it, was going to directly collide. And the, the robot decided, oh, well, I'm going to have to throw myself off my LIDAR kind of uh, track to avoid not hitting the person but then ended up in, in a fountain so a you know, part of it is this tech is there people are using it there's business applications you know we all know when we look at things like you know car 2x or you know tesla's autopilot you know it's got all this information but the problem with autonomous is exactly what it says it is using the camera feed and the computer vision to then say someone's walking out in front of you and then stopping and applying the brakes and creating a full image off the road and then having to do millions of simulations to be able to test these kind of environments. Now with car to X and infrastructure to X, the idea is, you know, you're stood at the traffic lights, you can't physically drive through them until it goes green uh, because the infrastructure, i.e. the traffic lights talking to your car and saying no. And so people like Aldi are already using this technology. You know, the radar emulator, which you see on the right hand side, which is popping up at the moment, like some futuristic uh, Star Trek thing, you can see it's just a whole stack of sensors underneath it, which a bit like the matrix can emulate what those, those cars or movement is on the screen. And that allows you to start testing things earlier and then not relying on the actual real world. So the people in the middle um, just stood outside of Canary Wharf in this particular instance is Stuart Moncrief, who right, uh, has got my, uh, mylowtest.com. And then Magic, who I was just mentioned, Magic Zaleski, who, who um, is now doing NFT testing. Um, 
so this tech and of course with covid and everything else you know testing in the wild is is is, is very challenging um so yeah so you know part of it is like i said there's so many applications to this but there's also so many stories of things that go wrong when it ends up rolling out this technology into the real world so i think the the most recent one is probably going to be hbo max you know hbo max uh, everyone's excited it's game of thrones and and um you know uh, house of dragon it launches it goes down everyone starts reposting including myself down detector to say well hbo max has gone down of course it has but hbo don't have a, have a cloud right apple don't have a cloud so who went down was it aws was it azure was it google cloud you know we're so reliant on other people's technology that when we start doing chaos engineering i know paul mentioned earlier about the qa lead.com podcast that i did I had a really good session with a guy called uh colton who uh owns a company called gremlin uh, and it, it, they do chaos engineering testing um and allow you to do and i know uh, aws two weeks ago uh now brought on a new service which is a fault injector service which pretty much just sp kills your kafka or you know injects loads of messages into it or does stuff that breaks your infrastructure so you can test how resilient and robust it is how it's able to you know come you know re resume back and, you know, I joke, you know, when we talked about augmented reality and, you know, it all seems quite primitive in the sense of, oh, well, yes, you know, I can go and play a game like Jurassic World and, and interact with, you know, flicking things. And I, and I stood up, I think it's on the next slide or the slide after, I stood up at start, last time I was at Star West and I kind of said, look, here's the model of testing Pokemon Go and every single permutation of Pokemon Go, we can emulate the GPX information. I can give the phone feed that it thinks it's walking around a different area, and I can classic gestures to go and catch the Pokemon. So suddenly, I never had to leave my house, but I could catch all of the Pokemon. You know, part of it is we've someone had to test it, which we did. Uh, but you know, these scenarios, especially in the wild, are a lot more complex and a lot more difficult. But they're also at a different scale that we've ever seen before, right? You know, part of things like them doing um you know live events within Fortnite, you know 10 million people all trying to get onto a platform which wasn't really designed to have snoop dogg or whoever else speaking if anyone's uh, watched uh, My uh mystic quest quest on on apple you know this joke around you know, getting so many people if your servers go down then you know you, you, it's a massive um you know uh, letdown for all your customers and it's also you know You've got to you've got to scale at some levels that you're never going to be able to scale at again. Um, so I mentioned you know testing Pokemon Go and at Star West, and so you can see over here we've got the, the camera uh, and we've got the actual flow, and it's in in the books that I have behind me. Um, it's kind of okay. How do I, you know, fool the sensors? And this was the same conversation we were just having. I was having uh, uh, while we the the first speaker was on. Um, you know, with Microsoft is. Well, I, we need to be able to give the feeds for the cameras, for the LiDAR cameras. We need to be able to give give the sensor information. We're using Connect to do body tracking. We're using um, custom Raspberry Pis to do uh, eye tracking, where we're creating virtual eyes that then the infrared can follow. You know, you have to be able to emulate all of the sensor inputs and test all of those, so you can then you know enable automation, end-to-end -end automation of it, thinking it is millions of people walking around a battlefield or you know millions of people um you know collaborating on a on our project or even someone conduct, conducting surgery right and of course they're all very time sensitive and also of lot you know of lag and i did this what is an api <laughs> Alexa, tell Hive to turn on to 21 degrees. I would love to. Your heating is now set to 21 degrees. And the, the irony of this 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 one was um, obviously you can see the lag of it going around, but I actually did this live on stage with an Alexa tap. And Alexa, surprise, surprise, started talking to me as I, I, I did that at the same time, which 
I'm sure it, you did, did find it on Wikipedia. But, you know, part of it is that device latency, and that was the exact same question as well we were talking about, is if I push a notification to your Apple or Google glasses, you know, how long between me sending it to you getting it in the same way Tesla, you know, you click the, your, your phone and it opens the car, you know, what is that latency? What's that round trip look like? What does that experience look like? You know, if something's live or semi-live, you know, just adding in all those times can really make a massive difference. And, you know, there's other things that add into it. We talked about all the sensor information which you've got, you know, where you can do, you know, many, maybe Peloton or, you know, your Apple Watch talking to Apple TV for your fitness, right? You, and also things like geolocations, right? So uh, what you probably see or don't see here is is my uh, uh, Greyhound, which was um, Pongo. And I had a geofence that said to me, if he gets out of a certain distance, then send me a notification that he's got through the fence or something. Uh, the problem is because he can he topped out at 30 kilometers an hour is, you know, he can cover a large distance in that period of time. So, yeah, and the same thing goes for, you know, uh, devices like sm scooters, right? I was in San Francisco um, a couple of weeks back and I got, uh, you can you order a, an autonomous uh, car, which will come and pick you up. So it comes and picks you up. There's no driver in there. You sit in it, you put your hands on the steering wheel and then it drives you to your other location. Um, you know, the same thing with the scooters. And they took, I said to them, well, you know, what happens if you'd had a drink beforehand? Obviously, you're not, but you can't order an Uber then, or you can't get on a scooter. And people would be on scooters in anywhere else in Europe or, or the US. You know, it'll limit in certain areas, it'll stop in built up areas because it knows the geolocation. Testing GPX and stuff is, is very easy. But again, these are all real world conditions that could lead into something kind of having a bit of a problem. And, you know, I, I obviously fly way too much, but, you know, you can see here, Red Boot, uh, you know, and I actually was there with a pen tester guy who purposely tried to do some real time testing in production. Probably not good on a plane if you're in the sky, but, you know, we see these problems going on in so many ways. And, you know, actually this is, again, five, four years ago. And, you know, you could go to a Chatsworth House, which is where, you know, Sense and Sensibility was filmed, and you could walk around the building or you could just wear a VR headset or in that case, it was the original Oculus Go thing. Um, but, you know, device testing, you know, these kind of devices of the future, you know, incredibly complex. Uh, you know, I know mentioned digital twins and kind of the, well, what is this kind of future landscape looking like? You know, this is a digital twin of a system that we built, which in all fairness, I should have included the demo. I did, did the demo at uh, S uh, Swiss testing days a few few months ago. You know where i actually showed them if you go to keysight.com you can and then open up your debugging information you can see you'll see a little file which is called stream um and you know partly what that does is it allows me to take what's happening in our on our website and then generate an entire model of the same user behavior in a digital twin um and so part of that that kind of capability you know i would the, one of the reasons i was down speaking with the cto of sujeti and and um, we were talking, I said, oh, well, yeah, you know, can you create, you know, a digital twin from things like log analytics? Of course you can, right? Um, can you take that open telemetry or um, open tracing and, and take that information and create a digital twin? Absolutely. And, and you know, part of what we're doing at the moment is we're, we're working on using digital twins uh, to actually be able to create anything so we we have a project at the moment which i'm running with my team called the, the uh, when we're naming it the flux capacitor and within the flux capacitor i can capture anything api ui um you know traffic whatever it is and we acquired a company recently called scalable networks which takes a pcap file and creates an entire digital twin of a network from it we do the same thing from the demo what happened earlier for apis is you interact those and this is the way up9.com works is it intercepts the traffic creates the model based on uh in essence a, a knowledge graph uh of that relationship and also the relationship of the the source so you know we're starting to use these ones and i've actually got you know next week i'm presenting to diego for the new forest wave um and you know the last time i showed him this i kind of said look you know i can you could run all your automation in UFT, for instance, and, and you know, Tricentus and SOAP UI and all these brilliant tools. And then I can literally create a digital twin of them and I can generate uh, agnostically. It could be in Selenium, it could be in, in our case, eggplant. 
could be in whatever you want. Uh, it could be in rest assured. It, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. But I can regenerate the, the entire digital twin and all the testing artifacts out of it. So therefore, you know, you've got that dependency model of, you know, if you're doing contract testing across a number of different API estates, which are all different versions, uh, and you've got that kind of chain API structure, you can literally reproduce that. Plus, you know, from a TDM perspective, you know, create the necess 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 necessary states and synthetic data. So, you know, digital twins really do bring this kind of capability to allow it. And, and then the next generation stuff, which again, we, we have at the moment, you know, where it will automatically generate this for you. So it can use things like spiders and it'll transform, uh, transpose an entire, you know, website or a, a mobile app or even a thick client application. It will go off and auto discover itself, which unfortunately is badly named as AI Turing uh, bots. But anyway, minus that, you know, this technology already exists today and, you know, and we're leveraging it for, for large estates of incredibly complex things. I say complex things in the sense of the space shuttle, what was launched, uh, is getting launched this week. We actually tested not only the NASA cockpits and stuff, which I know is Paul's SpaceX demo is, is, is phenomenal, but we can actually, we do actually, they use eggplant to test the shuttle. They use it to test the rover inside it. All of that equipment, you know, whether it's a, a, a fighter jet, uh, you know, we test that where they're looking through the cockpit, which, you know, Tom Cruise didn't have in the new Top Gun, but you can actually see through the bottom of the cockpit because the augmented glasses are overlaying where the cameras are coming off of the, off the actual thing. So we, we, we test all of that kind of technology because we're kind of in this landscape. Anyway, five minutes left and, uh, you know, I'm kind of, you're muttering on now. So I'm going to kind of with that in mind and, and kind of talking about testing and testing behind the, the bit in, in the, in the metaverse, and I'm going to link that bitly link, which you see at the moment, which is to Tarek's book actually, uh, which, uh, which is really good if you wanted to learn some fundamentals about AI driven testing, uh, and so much more. So anyway, with that said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and, uh, you know, I think we've got five minutes left for us, any kind of Q and A. Hey, Paul. Hey, Jonathan. All right. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for bringing up that video of uh, me in the in the digital world walking around doing that presentation. I think that was one of the coolest things that I've ever uh, uh, done in my life, and uh, uh, it was cool seeing me again, um, seeing that thing. Uh, I, I I just did that whole idea and concept was just amazing. Um, I wanted to ask you: Is there any um, is, are, are there any big wins that that you get out of testing? Because this seems like a whole new world that we're just getting into. Obviously, uh, any uh, any big uh, wins that you've you've come across uh, on this that uh, that you can share? Yeah, so, you know, I think I think we're changing the way we test, right? You know, we've been talking about this for ages. You know, it's it's kind of there's been this kind of I'm not I'm not saying. It, it's not changed much, but the three decades, four decades we've, we've spanned, right, is, you know, if you think about Mercury, if you think about Windrunner, and you think about XRunner, right, fantastic tools, enterprise-grade tools, that their own DSL, you know, in that case, TSL, and you've got the CD thing in there, I remember we were saying that. And I found mine in the, in the, I'm going to bring it out and send you a picture, I've got found them all shrink-wrapped uh, windows in, in the boxes, and I'm going to, we should raffle them off at the next event or something. Um, but you know that had some great capabilities like analog mode right where it was like xy coordinations no one ever would use that analog mode now we're in the metaverse where everything is an input and yes was now reliant on some of that wave of technology where you saw in the demo is like it sees something with computer vision it then knows it's got it's currently located at x and it needs to move the controller all the way up and down and then click it you might say well why can't we use WinRunner? And we could probably could, right? It's kind of the, the viewpoint of that. The principles and practices that we're using are still the same. Just the testing now is you're testing an autonomous car or you're, you know, you're testing the metaverse. You know, things are really challenging. And as you know, doing a lot of the NLP stuff, you know, part of it is we need to simplify it for everybody. And kind of this is where I think, you know, we're trying to get to at the moment, you know, is a lot around open testing. It's all around how do we standardize that so it doesn't matter you know 
it's like the stuff I was doing with, with Jason and Tarek, you know, with test.ai and the test.ai SDK, which I'd, I'd recommend anyone to go off and download, you know, part of it is it's all open source. It's an extension on top of Selenium that allows you to have leverage this kind of battle hardened computer vision to like what UFT is doing to kind of allow you to kind of train against images to say, well, I just, I no longer need to tell record anything. I can just literally say to it, click on this, go and do that, find me a tree, you know, select the tree, you know, it, it makes logical sense, but everything's sequential. And this was the big challenge, which I think is the change now is as by you writing a script, you are dictating a flow. And I think, you know, that's great, but that's the bit which we need to change is it's, it's the digital twins allow us to create these models of a, of a, a physical representation, whether it be something, a piece of equipment, like a mouse, you know, generating a model of that is very easy. Um, or, or maybe that, that, uh, that Atari I want, behind you. I want a digital twin of this, uh, of this yeah. uh, national steampunk. <laughs> That's what but I Yeah, mean. exactly. And, and this is the whole thing Helmet. is once you've got that model, right, you can then yeah. overlay that. You can create a digital version of that as an asset, which is an NFT, but you can also, you can try all the different permutations against it. It's like, how do I test that headset to make sure it, you can, if people wear it, it works, right? And I think that's what we're getting into is the blurring of the boundaries between testing and the, you know, and the real world. And part of that is it's not just one solution, right? It is an approach. People like yourself who are highly skilled in automation have learned and actually it's, it's more about the, the approach, the methodology than it is the tool. If everything is a nail, then everything is a hammer. And that was the old windrunner way. It's like the reason why mercury existed was uh, what selenium exists is it was the cure for mercury poisoning, right? We all know that story. Yeah. But I joke the same thing now is that, you know, what's the solution for selenium poisoning? Well, it's carbon, right? But we're not trying to replace selenium because selenium is a standard. We're trying to say that selenium is not going to fix everything. How do we, you know, encourage people like Sean to do, do gamedriver.io to create a driver for gaming environments, a, a driver for VR, a driver for Appium being the driver for mobile. How do we work on these universal standards that allow everybody to evolve their automation tools to add the value add, like Test Rigger, right? Brilliant product, NLP based, incredibly powerful. That allows people to accelerate and not have to go through all the pain of going through and, you know, learning languages and don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with learning a language. And, you know, I would rec highly recommend doing it. But, you know, part of it is, I think we're getting to that point now of maturity that we should be able to do the majority using AI-based AI assisted tooling to take us 90% and then use the brain in our heads to take us over that last 10%. 10 and I'm yeah. fortunately feeling quite crap today because I spent last night drinking four bottles of wine with, with Paul Gerrard. Um, but Paul spoke at Eurostar about exactly this. How do we create every tester into a super, have a superpower, right? They take what we saw in the first session today, you know, with APIs, you know, part of it is you're testing an application and you develop your, your tester over your SDED, whatever you want to call him for a second, over there is writing some API stuff. And you're doing some exploratory testing and suddenly it turns around to you and says, you know, he spotted something at the API level that could be a problem. Can you go in and validate it and give you a guidance that if you log in with this user and then change their name to from Paul Grossman to the dark art wizard, then go back into an invoice that you already previously, you know, sent out, it won't, it'll still be Paul Grossman, right? But it should, based on the con the new the new version of the swagger spec, is it should update everything because it's calling to get the latest information because Paul wants to be seen. As the dark art lord and i can give you a bit of a, a bit i know we've only got one minute left i can give you a bit of a spoiler that actually this year i'm changing my middle name to ai um and, and I'm doing it <laughs> just because it's hilariously funny but also i know every system that i go into now i'll have to put when it ever says middle name i have to put ai um and so you know part of it is you i could have changed it to drop all tables with a you know a, and and then literally cause some secrets <laughs> I kind of thought that was a bit harsh. And um, so I, I've been a bit, a little bit more responsible with my, my thing. But I think this is the whole thing. We, as, as much as we're eccentric and, and slightly crazy, you know, this is what we've got to do is we've got to drive, drive the industry to change things. Um, 
and work together, right? It's, you know, I'm going to call it one tool for a second or one automate, you know, everyone's got to get to, to help the automation landscape mature. Don't build your own frameworks, guys. Let's come together and actually allow us all to leverage all of these great powers and give us yeah. those superhero stuff. And we can then just work on which cape are we going to wear? What hat should we be putting on? And how cool should we look as an avatar while we're collaborating with the people on test automation awesomeness? Sounds sounds great. You said you have a book. In the last few seconds, I can give a, a we can give a plug to I that. Did, yeah, and you can see me make me short. I have a new book uh, up here as my AI camera tracks me. Artificial intelligence <laughs> in, in software testing with Rex Black, and everyone knows Rex. He was one of the original yes. ISTQB contributors. Um, great book. Uh, I highly recommend it. We're actually keysight.com is actually or eggplant software. If you go to eggplant software, giving the entire book for free. Um, so I, I'll make sure we, we share that link with, with the audience cool. as well. I always get books. You can see them all over here. Uh, someday this is going to break my desk, but uh, I like <laughs> my hard, hard, hard back books. Uh, uh, they're everywhere over here. So I'll, we'll, uh, I'm I'll going to say your, uh, again, and I'll send you uh, some signed copies of. Absolutely. Of and, uh, I would love that. I would love that. I'd, I'd that to my, I've got one by Linda Hayes, the automation frame uh, handbook from, from 20 years ago. So I, I, I'd love to add to that collection. Jonathan, I just okay, want to say we'll thank give you. Give them to the audience as well. But yeah, yeah, thank you so much for hosting. You're a, a superstar. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's been a pleasure <laughs> speaking with you. And uh, I guess we're going to wrap up this uh, session of the Zapple Tech uh, uh, Automation Meetup. Uh, I might be back next month. Uh, we're looking for a new uh, another speaker uh, on there. So if anyone wants to get up here and show off some cool stuff, like Jonathan did over here, uh, reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn. You, you know, find me. Find the Dark Arts Wizard. And uh, with that, uh, I'm going to go wrap it up here again. Thanks, Jonathan.